I've already learned a lot this morning, and I, you will see, I will show you a bit the approach how the European Union wants to tackle green infrastructure and uh, what are the differences as well. So I start, maybe, with one of the solutions we have found in Europe for tackling fragmentation. This is a, I will show you a, a small video of a French railway, uh, French um, authority for highways. So if you see that small trailer, So you see we are very innovative as well. <laughs> now we come to the, um, to the policy work, which is a bit less funny sometimes. So, um, as you've heard, I'm working in my European Commission, and I will first give you a small flavor of what we are responsible for. When looking at why we think green infrastructure is important, then what does the concept mean for us, and we give you a small a few of the case studies we have already there, and then going to the policy context of implementation. Um, we will see the icons below. I will explain them as well bit for bit in the, in the presentation. So the short introduction, maybe about the EU. Um, it's still an evolving um, kind of uh, item. So we started with six member states and are now at 27, and we have in the map, you see already some of the um, accession countries which want to join in as well, which are Turkey, Croatia, Macedonia, Iceland as well after the economic crisis. So we are still growing. Yes, not yet at 50 as you are, but we are coming close to that. We have about four, 490 million people, 23 official languages, a bit more if you, um, about 100 languages spoken, but only 23 official ones. The euro we have at the moment in 17 countries, so we have Estonia joining the EU, the Eurozone this year. And we have as a kind of a, um, a intermediate authority, uh, a level of, um, um, we have the regions which we are now at 271. This is important because a lot of green infrastructure relevant issues are decided on regional level. So, and we, our task we see from the Commission is to get all these different approaches which are already there, give them an added value on, an, an added value on European level. So quickly speaking about what the, e, what the Commission is doing, so the Commission has the exclusive right of initiatives, so all legislative proposals which, have, which are covering the whole of Europe are coming from the Commission and on the right you see uh, Mr. Barroso which is the President of the Commission the role of the Commission as well as the guardian of a treaty. So everything, we look at the provisions of a treaty and the measures taken by the institutions are really applied in the member states. If the member states fail, we bring them to court. And we adopt secondary legislation, which could be a regulation, directive decisions, also a voluntary agreements. And this secondary legislation is where the green infrastructure is to be looked at. So we have in environmental policy a wide range of instruments and actions like the overall planning uh, environmental action programs which are normally going for six years. Legislation, of, at the moment we have about 250 pieces of legislation which are almost, which are normally given a framework to the member states in which they are acting um, according to their, um, let's say, even regional or local depending from the authorities which are which are um, responsible for implementing the environmental key over there, so we have enough kind of um, space to find a solution which is best to them. We are, of course, giving funding, and this is one of the issues we look at green infrastructure, so how can we make a lot of different funding available for bringing more green infrastructure issues into, um, into action, into implementation? And I will later, or come to that as well to that point, because this is something which is, I think, very different from the EU and the US, that we are working a lot with this kind of government or EU funding, and we have not 
I think, not enough looked at the uh, investments which are coming from civil society. So this is uh, something that I would be happy to discuss about later. We working with market-based instruments. Uh, one of them is the emissions trading. We work with taxes and, and charges, which would then help to overcome market failures a bit, which in the case of ecosystems, we have a lot of uh, market failures. We have voluntary instruments like an eco label, for example, which could promote th issues or voluntary agreements that, for example, the car industry has now agreed to set a threshold on CO2 um, emissions per cars which, for the new cars which are being produced. So for green infrastructure, we need to look at all of these different kind of instruments. That's what we're doing. Why does it matter? So I've put one of the definitions, and there are a lot of them around, um, which is looking from a biodiversity ecosystems perspective to green infrastructure. That means the result of a planned long-term protection um, or structural change of ecosystem components in the landscapes results in benefits. So the benefit issue is one, uh, one we do emphasis, uh, to put emphasis on to biodiversity and the delivery of ecosystem services. It's a very kind of not a nice definition. We have, uh, we are now try to, we consult with our civil society and with uh, different parties to get a better grasp of how we can sell this much better to the people. So why does it matter? It matters because as we started from a biodiversity perspective, so the loss of biodiversity in the EU is um, uh, just three key of the key points. We know that Europe is the most fragmented um, continent on Earth. We have 50% of the wetlands and high nature fa value farmlands are gone in the last 20 years. For the wetlands, we have countries where we have lost 90% of, the, of wetlands, 99% of the bogs. We have, if you look at species, 40% of all European bird species have unfavorable conservation status. And this links it to the legislation. We, I come later to that. But we, say, but we see, we made a health check in 2009 when member states had to report to the Commission on the status of a species and habitats of European interest, and we found out that 50% of the species and up to 80% of habitats of European interest have an unfavorable conservation status. And if you look at the kind of pie chart where the gray issue means that we don't even know in which stages we are. So we are far away from fulfilling the aims of uh, directives, which of the nature directives for Europe. Um, of course, the unsustainable land use, this is the second thing we are um, put emphasis on. We have this fragmentation, the habitat degradation and loss. And you see the, le the map on the left, but especially the central European part is fragmented is literally, ecosystems are literally cut into pieces. The right uh, graph says between, in only 16 years, we had a, uh, a, a kind of an augmentation of urban sprawl and transport infrastructure of 8%, whilst agro-ecosystems and wetlands went down. This graph doesn't look at the conversion between intensive, in, extensive into intensive agri ecosystems, for example, which is much, much higher. So the, the, the picture is even uh, worse than we see. So at the end, we come always to the same um, conclusion that we need more intelligent ways of land use in the future. One way of how we think we can tackle this is um, we try at the moment to put a lot of emphasis on the ecosystem services approach to look which ecosystem services do we have there in Europe? Where do we have the problems? Um, and how can we benefit from them? How can we make our economy more based on the ecosystem services? So that we, these are, this is our life insurance and we would like to put this much more in the forefront of the decisions. We have um, commissioned a number of reports which are called TEEP, the, ecosystems of, uh, the economy, Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity which started in 2008 and are going on yet with where we ask uh, bank, banks and um, um, universities to calculate how much the ecosystems and their services do bring us. And we come to figures like that, that the annual welfare loss generated by lots of ecosystem services on the global scale will amount to 7% of the annual consumption by 2050, which is much more than the economic crisis we had. Oh, now I made a weird thing. Okay. 
So now you can see all of it. What I want to say, so we have to look with a green infrastructure approach at very different issues. We see the picture on the left, upper left, this is the Danube from Austria flowing into uh, Slovakian territory. On the left, you see that there are a lot of, um, the, the floodplain forest has been um, restored, which had direct benefits to the people living there because the groundwater table went up, the flooding risk went down, the, um, and, and nature as well prof uh, had a lot of profits. We have the people on the right were um, profiting from green spaces in the city. We have in the, in the center left uh, where we want to see how can we better link urban and rural areas. And we see on the far right there you see the, um, this is was a mudslide in Sicily. So we have disasters as well, which give us a lot of problems of natural disasters. We have a flooding on the low, lower part, which took place two months ago in Belgium and, and as well over a lot of the rest of the European territory. So these are already reasons enough to, to look why we could better implement green infrastructure. And I've left the two um, pictures, one on the left, lower part, which is the, this is a brown bear which uh, just died in a traffic accident in Greece. And the, in the center you see, a, I think you see a moose to this animal, which uh, went from the Polish, from the Polish mountains straight through the Czech Republic and uh, became very famous. And at the end, the, the kind of nature protection people didn't see any other way to help it than to um, transport it on a kind of a artificial way over the next highway that it could um, follow its migration route wherever it wanted to go. So we have a lot of issues at the moment where we think green infrastructure could be the solution for that. And now I come to that one, which is at the moment one of our top policy agendas is the climate change agenda. And we are advocating very much that we, we think we have understood that it's impossible to solve biodiversity loss without addressing climate change. And ex on the other hand as well, impossible to solve climate change without addressing biodiversity and related ecosystem services. This is one of our main message we want to give, um, seeing that, for example, that the ecosystems absorb half of the CO2 emissions and provide adaptation functions. So this is why we very much advocate green infrastructure, also in the field of climate change. So it looks already, it has given you a lot of already of a concept. So it's a lot about maintaining, strengthening, and restoring ecosystems. But it's, these are investments which give multiple benefits to people. Um, and our, our kind of angle of looking at it is we, we want to strengthen the functionality of ecosystems for the continued delivery of goods and services. Means as well that we want to enhance the resilience of ecosystems for the water and carbon cycle that they provide clean and fresh water that they we keep their water retention function that way, um, store the CO2. But as well, with the, same, with the same measure that we combat biodiversity loss by increasing the spatial and especially the functional connectivity between the existing natural areas and improve the landscape permeability. The benefits, apart from are what I have already said, we mitigate and adapt to the climate change effects and we want to reduce the vulnerability to the nature natural disaster risks. We contribute to develop a greener and sustainable economy, especially that we have now the situation that Europe wants to become more on the forefront of an, having an innovative economy to be as we are in competition, especially as well with emerging countries like China and India. So if you want to keep our position, we need to invest in new technologies. We need to invest in new investments, which would very much help us to um, to maintain the ecological services we have. And at the same time, as I've said, we are already such a fragmented con continent, we want to mitigate with green infrastructure the adverse, eff adverse effects of man-made infrastructure, especially in transport and energy, energy. And one key issue to that is the spatial dimension. So we, we, we advocate integrated spatial planning, which means that we try to promote the identification of multi-purpose zones and incorporation of restoration into the land use, the normal land use planning and policy. Um, and we have 
we, we see more and more that the sectoral approach, which has been there for decades, doesn't work anymore. And the earlier, and that we have heard already this morning, the earlier we, we put the stakeholders and citizens in the process, the better the outcome uh, comes. And we have a lot of economic benefits from that as well. So the components, as we have at the moment, put them uh, very quickly. So these are, in fact, the core ecosystems. These are the multifunctional zones, especially with the emphasis on restoring ecosystems, natural landscape features in managed landscapes, uh, especially in agricultural and forest areas, with artificial features as well, part of green infrastructure like aqueducts, eco bridges, um, all measures which help us to get the permeability of the landscape really in a, in a, to improve that one, for example, between forests and grasslands, and the urban elements. So we want re really want to get an all-encompassing concept which looks in urban and in rural areas. And one of the examples is we, we always bring is a floodplain forest. So how many, it gives us so many advantages when we restore a floodplain forest on a local scale where the people look at the recreation value of it. Um, on a regional scale, when we have the connecting of ecological networks, for example, the timber production, limitation of pesticides, etc. On a national, national or river basin scale, where we look very much on a flood retention capability of a floodplain forest. And on a biogeographical or a global scale, where we look very much on the climate change, um, carbon storage function and mitigation adaptation. We can, we start now having these examples um, on what is, are the costs and benefits of it. So we see at the moment there's a lower Danube flood risk mitigation scheme in the lower Danube countries, which costs, is about to cost 100, 180 million euro, which is a, so seems high, but if we compare it with the last damages we had in the 2005 floods, which were about 400 million euro, then we see that it is very, it's worth investing that. And I give you now a, a few, very few examples on where we have already, we have about, we, we now about 100, 150 different initiatives in Europe about green infrastructure. So I give you on the left side, you see that's Brussels region, the city of Brussels would try to get a kind of a green network within the town uh, borders. We see in the, in the center, this is where we can really get the local people involved in planting trees on strategically important um, um, places in cities. For example, on the right upper left side, you see the, a green roof within a city on the lower left, you see a green roof in the countryside, so it's not only urban uh, issues. On the right side, you see a, a functional agricultural landscape in Europe with a stone wall and a lot of hedgerows. <coughs> Regional scale, where we have another kind of issue, but still we want to keep it under the green infrastructure heading. On the left upper scale, you see this is a region of Wales, which we made a prioritization of the ecosystem services. Where are and we made an overlay of a number of ecosystem services to get prioritization zones where to invest in. You see in the middle, this is Barcelona province who made a GIS overlay of the different functions, prioritizations of the of their territory and to get out the best, let's say, best solution for their problems. And we see in the, on the right part, this is Bavaria and Germany. They had about 150 local actions for looking at the ecological network um, component of green infrastructure. We have national scales where we have as well a lot of, um, um, of experience already. I look in the left side, this is Estonia, uh, which has uh, put a green network. This is a 2010 uh, version. They started 30 years ago with that. So we are now very advanced at it. We have in the, the Czech Republic in the, in the upper right side, which has put a kind, what we call the territorial system of ecological stability. And you see in the, in, in the lower part, this is the Netherlands, who have their problems with climate change. We know it well that the two rivers which are crossing the Netherlands, knowing that most of the territory is below zero, they will have a lot of problems with water in the next, in the next coming years. And they try to, get, to give what we call room for the rivers. So we give more space to the rivers flowing to, through the Netherlands. And this is all is, in fact, applied green infrastructure. And we have also supranational scale initiatives. You see the Alpine um, arc in the, in the upper um, image, the Alpine and the Carpathians, which are crossing about together, I think, 11 countries. And this is very much NGO-driven, this, um, this work which is done there on ecological networks, for example, on looking on how we could 
um, prevent disasters, which are very frequent, where like avalanches, like mudslides, etc., by investing in nature. We have in the lower part, uh, these are four countries, you see, uh, the UK, um, it's the Netherlands, the Germany, and Denmark, we, who have made a planning on there, how we could put more green infrastructure in there, in their territory, and you see on the right, this photo and the map, are looking at the green belt, which is in fact the old Iron Curtain, which uh, is now tried to become the people, and this is also NGO driven, they try to buy this land uh, and to keep, the, keep it as a kind of a green, green zone, a green corridor running through Europe, from Finland, from almost the North Cup, down to Greece, down to Turkey, uh, between the, the division of the socialist and the and Western, Western Europe. So, and you see on the photo that sometimes it's very narrow, this part, but it's the only, these are the only territories which were left aside from intensive agriculture. And what happens at the moment as well is a lot of awareness raising from different uh, people. So we see on the left, the building green infrastructure for Europe. This is a, um, um, a publication which, is from, which, is, which has been done from the main NGOs in Europe. In the center you see the Kesse Tram. This is what the French call Tram Verte and Bleu. This is a government um, approach to put in ecological networks all over France. Ireland has uh, last year come up with a, um, a um, strategy for green infrastructure in Ireland. And you see in the, in the center the two words sustainable European infrastructures, which is uh, an initiative of the uh, European um, advisory councils to the governments. And finally, uh, on, the, on, the, on the lower side, this is what the UN, the CBD Secretariat put on ecological networks. Quickly, the policy context. So why now? We think it's now the time to go on with this green infrastructure approaches because we are ready for use, we're easily accessible, we involve people and build responsibility, we bring multiple benefits, we are cost efficient and make economic sense, and we are an integral part of the climate change adaptation and mitigation efforts. So a lot of win-win, multiple win situations. We want to emphasize more what we have done in the past for business and job your opportunities, that we, it contributes to the green economy economy and sustainable development, to invest in the ecosystems, and also the poverty reduction outside Europe. So we want to steer European money goes, if it goes into development, also goes into the restoration of the ecosystems. It, we have heard it promotes great uh, creativity, and often we can look at the traditional knowledge which is there on the, on, on the local uh, scale, and it helps building trust and partnerships. So all this, our task is to give a framework from the European Commission that these, all these initiatives can go forward with their, with their ideas. A quick look into the legislation we are looking in, in Europe. So we have two core legislation parts, are the Habitats and Birds Directive, and both together give, they build up what we call the Natura 2000 Network. This is the icon below. The Natura 2000 Network is a network of protected areas which is now covering 18% of European territory and it's the largest network of protected areas in the world. What we want to do with green infrastructure is to make this, this is more a patchwork than a network, that's what we know, because we are isolated sites to make that coherent, a coherent network. So we have the water directives as another legislative tool which asks the member state to put on, um, on a water basin scale uh, plans how to use the water, how to protect the groundwater, how to protect the rivers. The marine directives look at the marine spatial planning as well, the climate change policy, they have heard as well. EIA means the um, environmental impact assessment and SEA, the um, strategic uh, environmental assessment directives, which are at the moment revised and we want to put more green infrastructure elements in it. That's what we are doing at the moment. And the soils directive is just on hold at the moment. But all of these are spatial policies without they are none as well. And on the right you see the other policies where of course we, we, we are now working together with all the different other director generals to put to mainstream this green infrastructure issue. And I give two examples. This here you see on the map the green with Natura 2000 network. And what we want to do as I said with the green infrastructure is to put it in the wider countryside. So this would be a, a huge success if we got this patchwork of areas 
much more integrated, much more coherent. The second one is the, the case for the key systems and their services to, to, to really to invest into this instead of issues which would not help us with coming further to the sustainable economy in the future. That's what we want to do. And the last part on how to implement it. So I don't go through these ones, but yeah, because I've already said a lot of a lot of these issues. So just the background was we had this target to halt biodiversity loss till 2010, and we failed it. Now we are working on a on a biodiversity strategy, which will come out this month, um, after 2010, and we can see without integration of biodiversity issues in the wider agenda, we will not go nowhere. It's one of my we think this green infrastructure approach would help us a lot in, in coming closer to this. And it definitely, this um, biodiversity strategy has this headline target of halting the loss of biodiversity and then restoring the ecosystems and the services. And that's why we want to use green infrastructure as our main tool. I want also to mention what happened last year in October in Nagoya, there was the UN conference on biodiversity and they have and the 193 parties in the EU as well as a signing party on that has put a lot of efforts and a lot of targets which have a direct link to green infrastructure, which looks at the degradation and fragmentation and the um, connected systems of protected areas which are integrated in the wider landscape and in the ecosystem resilience, for example, the restoration of degraded, degraded ecosystems. And all parties who signed are responsible until 2020 to get these targets done. And this is why one of the, of the as well of the issues why the EU wants to um, go into the green infrastructure initiative that we can answer to these demands from the CBD, from the UN. Um, I, haven't spoke, I haven't spoken about funding yet. And the only thing that I want to say is that that's, that's for me the big learning issue here because we are we have a lot of EU funding instruments we can use, and we are already integrating the green infrastructure issues into them, and we can later discuss on what they are. So normally the agricultural funding and the regional fundings, the climate change funding as well. But we need a lot more non-EU funding to get really the, the critical mass on it. So, so apart from the governments and the European Inve Investment Bank, how can we, private banks, how can developers and civil societies get, how we can, make them invest in nature. This is a bit my thing which I want to learn here and I think you are much further as we are. And my last, this should be my, my second last slide is what we want to do is we want to put a communication on green infrastructure this year which gives the elements for discussion to the civil society and to the, to the governments how we can improve the existing legislation. We have already revised and are at the moment to revise the funding schemes to get green infrastructure in it. We want to deliver a guidance for green infrastructure, a toolbox on based on the best case studies we have, and we are happy to use American case studies for that as well. And step up, step up research on green infrastructure, really to understand how it works. And this brings me to the third um, icon below, the bees, how we pronounce it in French. It means KISS as a nice thing, but bees means, in fact, biodiversity information system for Europe. So where we, where we kind of collect in a, in a website which has a clearinghouse mechanism, all the data we need for the green infrastructure. We have started it, we are far from being complete, but we, we are on, it, on our way. And we need to step up the communication to the stakeholders. So we have a lot of initiatives, but we are not yet um, kind of working together. So how can, we, how can we step up this also with European funding, the training, the participation, the innovative financing capacity building? And and the last point, this is for us the most difficult one, to promote the integrated spatial planning as a required tool to implement green infrastructure because planning is, is the responsibility of the member states and we don't want the European Commission to, in, to kind of go into this um, area. We don't want to go to say to the member states, you have to do this, but we can at least, what we can do is we can promote good practices. That's what we do at the moment. Maybe in the future we come to a more coherent issue on that one. And now I'll come to the further information. Um, we have produced a number of um, publications on that that you see on our website. And how you see our website, I've put these kind of small cards on the handout desk and I have 
already heard that a lot of you didn't even know what it would be like, what it would be for. So it's just a USB stick. And on this USB stick, you have all the information on European nature and biodiversity, um, which, you, which, you would, which we have produced in the last years. Many thanks. <laughs>